we will get into that a little bit more after some preliminary thoughts. Uh, but we want to begin with uh, verse 3 this morning. Uh, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of the prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Uh, <clears throat> Blessed is he that readeth, it says. Uh, the thing that comes to my mind when I think about these verses is um, the, the way the Lord brings certain kinds of thoughts to our mind to think about more carefully. Uh, the very fact that we have the word readeth here uh, certainly brings to mind the revelation that has come from heaven in the, the form of the record book the record that God has given of his son. The entire Bible is written by God. It's written. Uh, <clears throat> why is it written? Why is it written down? Well, let's think about it a minute. I mean, this is the importance of coming to a place like this where we can turn aside and really think about what we're doing. Uh, really think about what God is saying. It's one thing just to read the Bible. It's another thing to study the Bible. And so our purpose is to come in here and study the scriptures uh, to discover precisely what God has in his mind that he wants us to know. There are things that he knows that he wants us to know. And it's critically important. And I'll tell you how important it is and why we have the record that God gave his son. Now, don't miss this. Think about it. If you were going to sacrifice your son for the sins of the whole world, how careful would you want the world to understand the reasons why. I mean, this is critically important. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, this is no little matter. This is serious business. And this goes to the very heart of God Almighty, the creator. And he does not want us to miss it. You know, oftentimes when our wife uh, gives us something to do, like go down to the grocery store to get certain items, and she starts telling you what it is she wants, and you say, baby, you better write that down. And so she goes over and gets a pen, and she writes down, and she enumerates the various things that she wants. That's very important. Uh, to have something written down is very important because uh, that way uh, your memory is not going to fail you because you can go to that piece of paper and you can read what it says and you can bring back all of the things that you were supposed to bring back. There are all kinds of things in life uh, that carry the same thought that is really here. It's not foreign to our thinking, the reason God has given us this revelation. Um, sometimes we enter into agreements with people. Uh, it may involve uh, um, uh, things like house rentals or um, the purchase of properties that can have to do with things like a will, you know, when you, uh, you want to write a will and you, you want people to remember exactly what it was uh, you wanted done concerning uh, your possessions, that kind of thing. 
And so an end of all strife is to get a lawyer <clears throat> and write it down and, and authenticate it with a, a stamp and so forth. That this is exactly what I have in mind. And, and if it's written down and somebody says, well, I don't think that's what he wanted or I don't think that's what he said. That's not the way I remember. You can pull out the piece of paper and it's an end of all strife. And so the revelation from heaven certainly has to do with a certainty of understanding. And, and when it comes to the, the mind of God and what God was going to do as it relates to the people of this world, Make no mistake about it. The Lord does not want us to make a mistake about it. And so he's written it in a book. He would not allow the human mind to contaminate in any respect the record. He, he was so... He was so uh, careful and, and guarding this record and the reasons of the death of his son so that we would not miss the reasons that he inspired the word with all kinds of warnings and, and in methods and ways that communicate how serious he was about the preciseness of what he was going to say and how he didn't want anybody messing with it. One of the things I think symbolically that carries this thought that we're considering here is the Ten Commandments written in stone. Why would God write it in stone? Well, for permanence. It would be preserved. Uh, because he didn't want anybody adding to it or taking away from it. And it's kind of hard to add to and take away from something written in stone without messing up the whole thing. You can't insert words when it's written in stone. There ain't room to insert anything. You don't change anything. And all throughout the Bible, there are these warnings. Do not add to and do not take away from my word. And so, if it were the case that the preservation of the Bible was dependent upon human beings, human intellect, human memory, or whatever, then... It wouldn't take long for that which was originally pure as it was when it was inspired. It wouldn't be long before it was contaminated with private interpretation. Now, can you imagine how guarded the Lord has been all throughout human history? concerning private interpretation of the reasons he would sacrifice his son. Folks, how in the world people can miss this is beyond me. Unless they're being very superficial in their approach to this holy book. This is an amazing thing the Bible. It's an amazing thing. And it can become commonplace because there's so many of them and we all have one. We're all sitting here with a copy of the Bible this morning and if we're not careful because we're so familiar with it in terms of what it looks like and so forth then you can, you can begin to, to just think about it uh, too casually 
And we need to we need to guard ourselves against that. Now, the first reason the Lord would write it, have it written, inspire men to write it down is because um, he did not want man to miss the message concerning why his son would die on the cross of Calvary. And so the first thing I'd like to bring to your attention is the focus of the father upon his son. But we can take it a little bit further and, and, and we can now focus the eyes of God upon the people for whom he would die. And I think these are two, per, two, two views that are critically important when it comes to the Bible. Because when the, when the Father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, the first thing that should come to your mind is the value that God placed in people. In people. I don't see how we could fail to see the love of God for the people of this world. And that he would do this thing that no human mind can really understand. Why would God sacrifice his only begotten son for you and me? Why would he do that? And, and so when it comes to the importance of the record and the, 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 the rigidness of this revelation, the exactitude of this revelation where... He doesn't want jots or tittles messed with. It is to be preserved in pure form. It's because he wants that message right out of his soul, his innermost self, to come right down here and reach the ones for whom his son would die. And not be wrong about the reason. And so when we read here, blessed is he that readeth. I submit to you that you can't enter into and appreciate that phrase without these thoughts. You're just reading words. And you're not touching the heart of God concerning this book. And that's what we need to do. We need to look into it. We need to understand why God said these things. And he said, blessed is he, supremely happy is he that readeth. And again, one of the reasons he wrote it in the book is because since the beginning, <clears throat> and you see, uh, it's important to Pay attention to this. Um, the original sin in the Garden of Eden was an intellectual pride. It was, uh, you don't need God to know. You can know. You can know for yourself. You don't need God. And God knows that in the day you eat of that forbidden tree, you're going to be as wise as him. And so the reason for the fall was pride of human intellect. And so we learned that uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, then God cursed the world. He cursed the world. And the very first effect of the curse was concerning, concerning human intellect. God cursed the human mind. And, uh, and one of the uh, 
the symptoms of the curse is memory. Memory. I'll never forget sitting here in this church many, many, many years ago when I first heard uh, Pastor Kelly talking about some of these things. And he was talking about how Adam, when God created him, uh, had a photographic memory. And, and he made the statement that if Adam had been handed a, a copy of the Bible, he could have sat down and read it from cover to cover with one reading and quote it to you. Total recall. Photographic memory. No memory loss whatsoever. None. Because there wasn't any. There was no memory loss. And so one of the reasons we have the Bible is because of memory loss. And our minds are getting worse and worse and worse in regard to memory as the generations go by. So it is not true that man is evolving. We're devolving in every respect. And I, I have always thought that that line of reasoning that I learned right here in this church was amazing. I was amazed. The first time I ever heard that, I was amazed. And, and one of the evidences of the truth of it was my own mind. And how hard I had to study in school. And how it was a labor to read. A labor to study, and it is. It's a labor. We have to work at it. We have to, it's hard. And the reason is because the curse, the curse upon the human mind, the, the whole world is cursed. And it makes all the sense in the world that it would, it would start right there where the problem started, and that is in the human mind. So when we have a problem remembering things, uh, we ought to own the reason. There's a reason. But most of the time our thinking doesn't go any further than the statement, you know, I just don't remember. I don't, I just don't remember. Well, let's go a little deeper. Why don't we remember? Why can we not remember the list uh, that our wife gives us just from memory without the piece of paper? Why can't we remember? Well, if you want to really understand why you need it written down, it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. I think it's important for us to know that and to think about it often. This world is not as God intended it to be. But the grace of God is manifest right here in that he knows our situation. And he knows we can't remember. And so he wrote it in a book. And what a wonderful thing it is to go back and to read it and to read it, and to read it again, and to memorize the verses. It's hard to memorize. I've never liked memorizing. It's work. It's hard work. It takes discipline to memorize. And uh, think about it. Adam, he didn't have to work at it at all. He just looked at it. That was it. Complete recall. No memory loss whatsoever. So supremely happy is he that readeth this book. So we want to think about 
the importance of the word read is because it brings to mind the record that God has given of his son and why. Because he doesn't want us to miss uh, the reasons for the death of his son, his only begotten son. And he doesn't want the people for whom Christ died to miss the reasons as it relates to them. We've got a problem. We've got a problem. And our problem is in our nature. And one of the most shocking things that has ever come to my mind is the discovery from this book, because I'd have never believed it if it wasn't in the book, that I hate God in my nature. I didn't know that. I know it now. I know that I've got a nature in me that despises him and wants him dead. Just like the devil wanted him dead. That's why he was crucified. The proof of what I'm saying is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus was crucified by those that were representative of man at his best state. They hated him. They saw no need of God, and every man lives that way with no real need of God. We don't need to read the Bible. What do we need the Bible for? We got our own mind. We can think. What do we need his will for? We got our will. Our will is what's important, not his. And so we get busy at trying to fashion a God that is... Uh, at the very most, just complimentary of our own will. In that, if we run into a snag, we're going to get on our knees and we're going to pray and we're going to say, Lord, I got a problem. I wanted to bring it to your attention because I believe you can help me out here. My sovereignty just doesn't seem to be getting what I want for my life as quick as I'd like to have it. And so I would like to invoke your um, sovereignty to bring it to pass so that I can be happy. I'll be a happier person if you'll answer my prayer. And that's all God means to most people on the face of this earth. We could care less about the will of God. What we care about is our will and a God that will help our will to be done. This is in complete and total contrast to the statement of the Lord Jesus in John's Gospel, John's Gospel chapter 5, where the Lord made it abundantly clear that he did not come into this world to do his will, but the will of him that sent him. We don't think that way. Because what's going on in our life is too important. It's more important than God. It's more important than His will. And we would not know that apart from this record. I would not know that that's my view of God if this book didn't say it. And I would probably get very mad with somebody that would suggest that I didn't love God and would go so far as to say that I hated him. But I know that I've got a nature that does, and I know that you do too. We don't like to think about it, but we do. And the way many of us live day by day is a proof of it. Most Christians that go to church on a regular basis do not study the Bible. And they're not going to. And there are people in this church that will come here and hear messages like this and go out of here and not be any different. Go out and not be convicted of the need 
to have the discipline in the life to say, I am going to study this book every day of my life. And I'm going to spend time with this great God that has given it to me. We need to be that way. Blessed, supremely happy is he that readeth. And then he says, um, and they that hear the words of the prophecy. So what's he talking about there? Blessed is he that readeth and those that hear it, well, is he talking about the difference between um, just reading the Bible versus coming to a church where somebody is going to be preaching from the book so you have the opportunity to hear it? Well, maybe that would be a, an appropriate application of the wording. But I think it goes deeper than that. Because you see, in the Bible, the Lord heals certain people with ver various uh, issues, health issues. <clears throat> he healed the blind. And he, he healed the man that couldn't hear, that was deaf. He, hear, he healed him. And, and all of those healings were outward illustrations of spiritual truth. Because, you see, it's one thing to see with the eye the physical world. But it's another thing to see with the understanding. You know how people use the words, oh, yeah, now I see. There's a, there's a spiritual seeing. And there is a spiritual hearing. So when God healed the man that was deaf, what the Lord is communicating to us by these miracles is not just the miracle. It's deeper than that. Because you, have you ever, for instance, uh, wanted somebody to be saved so bad and you'd bring them to the church and they would hear the message but not hear it? And you would witness to somebody and they would hear the words, the audible words, the sounds, but they would not hear. Well, the message of the Bible is, apart from the miracle of God inter inter intervening and being a part of what's going on, to miraculously open somebody's ears so that they can hear spiritually the truth they won't hear. It's impossible to hear unless God miraculously opens the ear to hear. And so it's one thing to, to read the record, but what the Lord wants us to do is, is hear the record spiritually. He wants us to hear it. Uh, what he's talking about is receiving it. it it's, he's talking about a, a, a consent, a, a consent, a mental consent that it's true. It's a true message. It's a true record. He's telling me the truth about myself. And I'm hearing this message. But we live in a world where proof is very important when it comes to believing anything. Uh, when we go to court with our beliefs about certain issues in life, we have to bring to the court the proof of evidence, evidential proof. And when it comes to man and his relationship to God, 
uh, proof is very important. He wants to know. And so if you can provide a person proof for your reasons to believe there is a God or that Jesus Christ is God, then his belief is strengthened because of the evidence. Well, what about God's perspective as he looks toward man? Do you reckon he would appreciate proof from us as well? I think so. And so what kind of proof is he looking for? When it comes to these things that are mentioned in verse 3, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of the prophecy of this book. Do you reckon keeping it would be a proof? I think so. A person that keeps those things which are written therein is a person that is setting forth the evidence to God that he has read it and that he's heard what he read with spiritual ears. And the proof is a converted life. I'm keeping it. I'm keeping it. That's the sense of these scriptures. A person who claims to be a Christian who does not keep the word of God is a liar. A person that comes in here and, and hears the teaching and has a profession of faith in Christ, but he's not carefully studying the scriptures and applying the scriptures to himself and going out here and keeping it as a way of life. A changed life. I'm talking about a radical change where other people can see you and they know something happened to that person. They're different. They're different. And I, I know I can remember some of the things they used to do, but they don't do that now. They're different. The Lord said, if you love me, Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. Prove it. Prove that you love me. Keep my commandments. This is the sense of this third verse. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of the prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Time is at hand. What's he talking about? Time is at hand. Well, the whole book is about the fact that he's coming quickly. I'm coming. I'm coming quickly. Wouldn't it be to our advantage to understand all of these things in advance? And our lives be converted to be the way he wants us to be at his appearing. The time is at hand. Folks, can you imagine the shame that we're going to experience when we look in his face? The one who died for you and me. And we reflect back on the way we've lived and how little a role this book was in our life. We've got a church here. It's an amazing place. I was speaking about it the other week. And it's, we've got a, a church here in Acreage and we've got now the result of many years of people sacrificing and dedicating their lives for what they grew to understand was the importance of this book. And we've got a generation of young people coming along here that have no clue what this place is all about. 
No clue. It's just a part of life. I mean, it's the Calvary Memorial Church is down here on down the street. We've got a laundromat, and then there's a drugstore. We've got Walmart. We've got several places you can go to eat. And it's just a place. It's just another place. No, it isn't. It's not just an <clears throat> another place. <clears throat> it's a very special place. We've got young people in this church that do not even know who Kent Kelly was. Because they were little tiny things. Uh, when he passed away. And uh, even those that were 10 years old, uh, when he was here, what does, that, what does a 10-year-old remember? What does a 10-year-old know about the people in this church and the contribution that people were making all along the way? What do they know about these things? Probably no more than the children that were born to those that fought with Patton over there in the Battle of the Bulge. What does this generation know? I'm telling you, it's when you when you look at the situation, when you think about the the value of these things and, and the, the, the sense of these scriptures and the kinds of things that we're talking about this morning. Are we going to have young people in 15 years, if the Lord tarries, that are going to be teaching these things and understanding the value of this place and fighting for the doctrine of the faith and saying, we will not change. We're going to stay true to the doctrine. We, we quoted this many times, old Hegel's statement, history teaches us, say history teaches us nothing. If we do not know where we came from, we certainly cannot know where we're going. And I submit to you that we've got people in this church coming along, young people that have no clue where we've been and they have no idea which way we should go because they do not know where we have been. They're too preoccupied with sports and computers and cell phones and entertainment and fun and girls and boys. And we will lose this ministry if the families do not take charge of their children and turn them aside from time to time and say, listen, this church is your life. It's your life. And it's special. It's special. It's very special. So you go down to verse 4. And we get to what I really wanted to teach this morning. John to the seven churches. John to the seven churches, which are in Asia. Do we understand the critical importance of the church? How important is the church? I recall many years ago, Pastor Kelly brought a message in this church, and he talked about things in order of importance. And he said the most important decision you'll ever make is trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. And then everybody was a bit surprised 
by his second in the order. Because he said the second in the order is where you go to church. And then marriage. And then where you work. Where you work is of last importance. I'll never forget that message. And the reason is because I never heard that before. I never heard anybody talk about the importance of the church. And the more I sat here and listened to what he had to say about the importance of the church, I, I began to realize that, you know something, the God of the universe, the creator God, my, my God and my Savior, has, uh, has built a place that he's going to meet with his people and teach them about his will and um, he would give them the message from heaven so that they would know how to have a life that's meaningful and make right choices because you see life is about choices you make all these choices if you make a wrong choice it's disastrous. Like, for instance, who you choose to marry. Boy, the ramifications of that are enormous. And if you get it wrong, it's a lifelong commitment, and you'll struggle the rest of your life if you marry the wrong person. So how are you going to know which one to marry? In the church. The church is more important than marriage when it comes to the order of importance because your relationship to the Lord is more important than your relationship to your wife or your husband or anybody else on the face of the earth. Now, we don't want to think that's true, especially in this focus on the family generation that we're living in. But I'm telling you that the focus that God has concerning the family is the eternal family. It's not your little family. It's the family of God, the eternal family. I'll tell you a tragic thing, and a lot of people don't understand this. They certainly don't want to think about it, think about it much. Most of the people, listen to this carefully, most of the people, in human families, as we think about families, are going to hell. They're not going to heaven. And there are a lot of families that think somehow or other, by my choices, by my wisdom, by all that I am and what I have invested in terms of importance of my family is going to ensure the best for my family. And I'm telling you, you're not big enough to pull that off. No mother, no father is big enough to pull that off. So that the outcome of our influence is going to be for the betterment of everybody involved that are close to us. That's not the message of this book. The Lord raises up pastors and teachers to teach people what they don't want to hear. And I learned this from a faithful pastor a faithful witness. That's where I learned it. Where did he learn it? Out of the record. Because this is the record. And what God has done is, and he tells us about it in Matthew 16, he is the architect of the church. And he said, upon the testimony of Peter, 
who got my identity right. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, upon this rock, the rock of this testimony, I will, I will build my church. I will build my church. When I look at Calvary Memorial Church, I don't see Kent Kelly. I don't see Donald McConaughey. I don't see some of those pastors that were first involved in this church being what it is today. I see Matthew 16. I see the architect of this place is God. It was the hand of God. As he worked through the lives of people who were surrendered to him completely. And the Lord raised up a mighty work here. And, and, and we were taught to defend the faith, to defend, to be protective of the doctrine. And to understand the importance of the King James translation and the problem that was going on in the world when it came to all these other versions. We, we were taught that the reasons for this book have to do with what is close to God's heart. That's what we were taught. And God raised up this place, and I tell you the importance of it. It's not just a, a place among many places. It's very special. Because God has designed to meet with his people here. To teach them the closest thing. Uh, to his heart. That's his love for you and me. And God <clears throat> said, salvation is of the Lord. It's not of you. It's not of the family. It's not of the preacher. And the pastors that we've had in this church and the one that we have right now understands this perfectly. We can't save anybody, but we know who can. And so we point them to Christ. He can save. That's why we don't give invitations, endless singing of songs to get people to come forward in the meeting because salvation is of the Lord. And no one is going to get saved that doesn't desperately want to. And when a person desperately wants to get saved, you don't have to ask them to come down the, the aisle. They'll come pounding on your door wanting to talk to you about their soul. They'll do that. They'll run you down. And those are usually the ones that are the same 10 and 15, 20 years later still serving the Lord. But there are multitudes that come down the aisle. A month later, you wouldn't even know to go to church. Folks, for your homes, for your children's sake, you got to teach them how important this place is. Because this is where you learn these things. And God raises up people to understand these things, to teach these things. And I've been so blessed over the years to have been in a church where I could be taught these things and surrounded by people who have taught these things. Our time is gone. Let's uh, look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time we've had to consider these thoughts. Bless our memories so that we can remember them. And we ask these things for your honor and for your glory and for thy name's sake. Amen.